A reading from the New Testament, Acts chapter 16, verses 16 through 21. One day, as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune-telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, These men are slaves of the Most High God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days. But Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, These men are disturbing our city. They are Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to adopt or observe. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I want to first thank David McAllister Wilson and the President's Office for their role in making this celebration happen today. I want to thank Robert Martin and the Dean's Office for their role in planning this celebration today. I want you all to know that you are very special to me and that I am glad you are here. So I want you to know that you're very special, but there are a couple of special people I need to thank. So if I don't call your name, don't think that I don't think you're special. (laughs) I want to thank um, the foundation, Jane Boatwright Wood, Larry Kleeman, and Stephen Gunter from the foundation for coming out for this event. And I especially want to thank Stephen Gunter. So those of you who have have had me as a professor, you can blame him. He's the one who taught me everything I know. So whatever I know, it is his fault. Great appreciation for your mentoring and what you've meant to me over the years. I want to thank Millie Scarlett for agreeing to bless us with her angelic voice. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here. I want to thank Andrew for coming from Memphis to uh, hang out and be a part of this celebration. Great appreciation to you. And of course, the most special person of all, I want to thank my beautiful wife for coming and sharing in this day. So thank you all. Having said that, let's um, get to it. My topic this morning is troublemakers. Troublemakers. Let us pray. Gracious God, may they See a word from you as I'm hid behind the cross. May you speak prophetically to them. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Andrew read the scripture, but I want to read this last part again from the King James, where it says, And they brought them to the magistrate, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city. They go above and beyond what is necessary to cause trouble for our city. When I was growing up, a person close to the family was an expert on troublemakers. Someone would call the house, and when this person got off the phone, a comment would be made to the spouse that typically went something like this. Sally is coming and bringing the kids. Now, as I got older, I understood that not naming the kids was a code language to the spouse that the kids, in this person's opinion, were troublemakers. This person believed the kids were going to create havoc in the home. So a plan needed to be developed to try and figure out how to maintain the status quo with the least disruption and to get rid of the troublemakers as quickly as possible. What was not wanted was outside troublemakers disrupting the environment. The environment was fixed a certain way and should stay that way. In a weird sort of way, upon reflection, I believe this person almost had a fear of troublemakers because it caused this person 
to often take drastic counteractions to prevent the status quo from being altered. <laughs> so in an attempt to protect the status quo, the persons themselves were disrupting the status quo. I wonder if many of us in this room are comfortable with the status quo. But the real question is, are we comfortable with troublemakers? Our text for today deals with troublemakers. It turns upside down the person close to my family's understanding of troublemakers. In this text, we find that Paul is being called a troublemaker. He's being named as one who upsets the status quo. A young lady who is a slave is following Paul around who has a spirit in her. The spirit enables her to tell the fortunes of others. This young lady is making money for those who own her. Paul gets fed up with the spirit that is in her and calls it out. This action by Paul upsets the owners of the slaves. In common language, Paul was messing with their money. So the owners go to the magistrates and say, these men are troubling our city. These men are disturbing the status quo. What I find particularly interesting is our understanding of who is a troublemaker often hinges on our understanding of the status quo. Like the person close to the family, when we define troublemakers from our perspective to what they are doing to us, not the perspective of what may be transformed. As long as the status quo is maintained and folk are willing to go along with the status quo, then we are okay. But as soon as someone starts messing with the status quo, we often see them as troublemakers. Is it possible that we need troublemakers to, to, to transform the status quo, to bring about change? We are here today because I am a part of the E. Stanley Jones Professors, funded by the Foundation for Evangelism. Some of you are wondering, who is E. Stanley Jones? <laughs> there is a great resource by Ann Matthew Younes, a Wesley alum and the granddaughter of E. Stanley Jones called The Life and Ministry of E. Stanley Jones. I don't have time to tell his whole story, but let me share that as a young man, he started disturbing the status quo. At the age of 23, he went to India as a missionary. He would travel to India several times during his life. Of course, this in itself is not unusual. Jones was unusual because of the way in which he engaged in dialogue about Christianity and was influenced by his interactions in India. He did not simply follow the status quo of dictating the gospel to others. He engaged in deep dialogue with others about faith. This engagement led him to start what he termed roundtable conferences in India where Christians and non-Christians came together as equals to share their religious experiences. An ideal that challenged the status quo of missionary activity, Jones troubled the waters by listening to voices of non-Christians and valuing their perspective. Jones engaged in dialogue with and corresponded with one of the greatest troublemakers of the 20th century, Gandhi. The two men developed a mutual respect for one another, even though they came from different religious experiences. What is evident, if you read Jones, is his engaging individuals like Gandhi did not detract from his Christianity, but it deepened his commitment to Christ. It deepened his understanding of his faith. I believe it deepened the way he practiced Christian principles like invitation and hospitality, because he was not afraid of disrupting the status quo. In the spirit of Jones, we are called to be invitational, even when it means upsetting the status quo. We are called to be hospitable, even when it means upsetting the status quo. We are called to participate in God's work of transformation, even when it means upsetting the status quo. When you do these things, sometimes, as Paul experienced, you will be labeled a troublemaker. Folk will be mad that you are disturbing the peace. I could go on with other things that Jones did to disturb the status quo, but I believe foundational to what it means to be a professor of evangelism in United Methodist Church is the spirit of a troublemaker. If we follow Jones, we are not called to simply maintain the status quo, but are called to listen for God's calling to be troublemakers.
to be those individuals challenging the church to embody community in a different way. But let me talk about another troublemaker. This troublemaker coincidentally read E. Stanley Jones's book on Gandhi and wrote to Jones, who reports this in his autobiography. At our point, this nameless troublemaker tells Jones, it was your book. It was your book on Gandhi that gave me my first inkling, nonviolent, non-cooperation. Some of you have probably guessed, I'm talking about Martin Luther King Jr. It was not coincidental that King, like Jones, upset the status quo. As a young adult, King went to Montgomery, Alabama to be the pastor of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. It is in Montgomery that King became one of the great clarion voices of the civil rights movement, a movement built on disturbing the peace. King and others challenged the status quo by pointing out the inequities in the system, refusing to buy into those inequities and failing to cooperate with those trying to maintain the status quo. But like Paul and Silas in chapter 16, King was often sent to prison because he was a troublemaker. I can imagine Jim Clark and Bull Connor going to the public square and saying, this man is troubling our city. He's upsetting the status quo we worked so hard to maintain. King, in one of the trips to jail, spelled out in no uncertain terms the danger of maintaining the status quo. In a letter from a Birmingham jail, King begins with these words. While confined here in the Birmingham City Jail, I came across your recent statement calling our present activities unwise and untimely. Many of us here know that King is right, that those who are seeking to maintain the status quo never see activities pointing to a new future as wise or timely. The activities are almost always perceived as unwise and untimely. The men mad at Paul did not perceive his calling the spirit out of the young lady as timely or wise. When you disturb the status quo, the pushback is going to be monumental. Let me quote what I believe to be the most challenging paragraph in the letter for us gathered here today. King writes, I must confess that over the last few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in the stride toward freedom is not the white citizens council or the Ku Klux Klan, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. Who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I can't agree with your methods of direct action. Who paternalistically feels that he can set the timetable for another man's freedom. Certainly this paragraph is challenging because it speaks to the racial tensions we are experiencing in the United States. Unfortunately, these words from King still resonate in ways that many of us wish they would not. Over 50 years later, King's words still have a prophetic edge for as we seek racial harmony. But I also believe King's words should be prophetic for us in another way, a growing challenge that many of our congregations cannot ignore. Our attitude towards some young people as troublemakers in congregations. All right. King's word should challenge us to think deeper about our attitude toward young people seeking to alter the status quo. Like those King was writing who perceived him as a troublemaker, we see young people as troublemakers, especially those who want the church to be more justice and mission focused. We treat them paternalistically because their timetable is not our timetable. We agree we want them from the church, but not their methods of practicing church. King is speaking to us here today, not only about race, but the dangers of not recognizing the ways in which we maintain the status quo. Many of our congregations are at an intersection, not sure how to move forward. They want to maintain the status quo because it's what is familiar and has been life-giving for many of them. But they also realize they are in decline and in need of new life. 
The way many of our congregations resolve this dilemma is by inviting those who are new to maintain the status quo. They want them to be a part of what already exists and not to upset the apple cart, not cause any trouble. Trouble, like asking why the focus is on building maintenance and not missional engagement. Trouble, like why do we exclude some and accept others? Trouble, like questioning who is in leadership. Trouble, like why can't we engage in healthy theological dialogues? We want young people to come, but we don't want them to trouble our congregations. But let's talk about trouble. Let me give you some troubling statistics. According to a religious news service report from March of 2015, 7.5 7.5 million Americans since 2012 have declared themselves religiously unaffiliated. When you look at a breakdown state by state, the fastest growing population in a majority of the states are the religiously unaffiliated. If you couple this report with research from the Pew Foundation, which did a survey in 2014 of 35,000 individuals, It is the millennials who are the fastest growing segment of unaffiliated. Talk about trouble. We are experiencing in this country a decline of those affiliated with any religion, and it is young people who are dropping out the fastest. Now, I have to believe the majority of us see this as problematic. If we don't see it as problematic, we shouldn't be here. Mm. We see this as troubling. Simply seeing this as troubling is not enough. We need to be open to those seeking to transform the status quo. We have to stop yelling in the public square, these folk are troubling our city. So the question is, what are we to do? I believe we need to be intentional about forming troublemakers. In the text, Paul gives us some clues for how to cause trouble. Paul says we have to move beyond annoyance. We have to move beyond annoyance. In the text, the girl had been following Paul and Silas around for days. The text tells us that Paul was annoyed by her continuing shouting out. So Paul does something about it. Paul calls the spirit out of the girl. Paul takes action. What Paul does seems obvious. Many of us would say, well, of course he took action. The truth is, we have fallen to a space where we are annoyed by what is happening in the church, but are in a malaise in terms of taking action. We can describe the problem, but are struggling to move beyond the description of what is wrong. There were those who were concerned about the train of UMC ministry candidate years ago, especially as it relates to evangelism. They did not just stop with being annoyed that candidates received no evangelism training, they started the foundation for evangelism. The foundation started the E. Stanley Jones chair, and one of the foundational individuals to hold the chair was James C. Logan. When I'm out and about, I wish I had a dollar for every person who shared with me the impact Logan had on their lives. I could retire today and not have to accept this chair. president saying, no, I can't retire today. (laughs) Logan helped to shape a couple of generations of leaders who prophetically engaged the public square. Logan is one of the pioneers who exemplified why these professorships were created, not to maintain the status quo of the church, but to trouble the waters. It is up to me and others who follow in his footsteps to continue this work with new generations today. Here at Wesley, we are a part of that great work of forming troublemakers to transform the public square by thinking outside of the box. Latoska Nelson and her husband Armand, current students at Wesley, are causing trouble at their DC congregation by seeking to be involved in the lives of children by feeding them. This is getting more people from the church involved in the community and more people from the community involved in their church. And according to Latoska, there's been 17 new people joining the congregation in a year because of their work in engaging the community. 
They were not satisfied with being annoyed about the lack of food for children. They did something about it. So Paul teaches us that if we want to be troublemakers, we have to move beyond being annoyed and take action. But Paul does something else in this text that is critical to being a troublemaker. He deals with the consequences of his actions. He deals with the consequences of his actions. See, it's one thing to take action, but it's another to be willing to deal with the consequences of our actions. Jones had to live with the consequences of being in fellowship with those outside of Christianity. King had to live with the consequences of protesting against racial injustice. When you are a troublemaker, not everyone is going to like what you are doing. One should not set out to be a troublemaker if they are unwilling to deal with the consequences. What I'm trying to say is troublemaking is not glamorous. The reality is Jesus ended up on the cross. Now, I'm not suggesting just because you're a troublemaker that you're going to end up on the cross, but I do believe you will have a cross to bear. It may be the cross of isolation. It may be the cross of overachieving. It may be the cross of loneliness. But you will have a cross as a troublemaker. One of the crosses for the foundation for evangelism is telling the story of transformation in the midst of decline, persuading others that we are, in fact, making a difference when everyone around us keeps pointing to decline and decay. But thank goodness there is good news. There are stories to tell. For example, the work of Elaine Heath in starting intentional living communities around Dallas-Fort Worth and the difference they're making. Here at Wesley, our own Birch Intentional Living Community has individuals who are seeking to make a difference in unhoused ministry by partnering with Asbury and Mount Vernon Place congregations. These are stories of young adults committed to making difference in the lives of others, committed to bearing the cross for what it means to be a troublemaker for transformation. As the James C. Logan Professor of Evangelism and E. Stanley Jones Professorship, that is a mouthful, this is my calling to help form troublemakers who are prophetically engaged in the public square, to help form troublemakers who ask the hard questions and seek to be in community with those not a part of the congregation, to help form troublemakers who are creative and innovative, to help form troublemakers who are committed to following God's calling to encourage a new generation of individuals who are not afraid to wade in the water, knowing God is at work troubling the water. Amen.